In his follow-up performance as Harry Palmer in The Ipcris File, Michael Caine returns for the next spy adventure in Funeral in Berlin. But in the world of spy movies, whose funeral is it in Berlin? Hi, this is Tom Pizzotto. And Dan Silvestri. From SpyMovieNavigator.com. Today we're cracking the code of Funeral in Berlin. If you like our podcast, please give us a five-star rating on your favorite podcast app. That helps a lot. We'll divide this podcast into two shorter parts, which our listeners have been asking for. So let's get going with part one. Oh, we just heard a little clip from the music by Conrad Elfers from The Funeral in Berlin, and it really is kind of a dirge melody. So it sets the tone for what we're going to see. And Today it, is we're... Different, it is different than the John Barry score we heard before. So Absolutely. It's, it's, from the it does song. change the flavor a little bit. Yeah. Today we're talking about another spy movie, but not just any spy movie but one where the character Harry Palmer continues to develop his character from the Ipcris file. Here we see another spy other than Bond developing into an ongoing story. And this is based on the novels by Len Dayton. Now the main players in the funeral in Berlin are Michael Caine, of course, as Harry Palmer, Paul Hubschmidt as Johnny Vulcan, Heinz Schubert as Aaron Levine, Nicholas Valls as Werner, Oscar Homolka as Colonel Stock, terrific, Eva Renzi as Samantha Steele, and Gunther Meisner as Kreutzmann. This is the second movie in the Harry Palmer trilogy. We've done a two-part podcast on the first movie, The Ipcris File, earlier this year, and you can get to that by clicking on the card above. Today we're diving into Funeral in Berlin, but there are ties between Bond and other spy movies and Funeral in Berlin, and we're going to look at all the connections right now, and whose funeral is it? There's a line in this movie by Colonel Stock about halfway through where he references storming the Winter Palace in St. Petersburg. Yeah. The Winter Palace is now a part of the wonderful Hermitage Museum. And my wife and I happened to get a tour of the Hermitage Museum. I strongly recommend if you do get to St. Petersburg, you do check out that museum. And while you're there, they do have the Fabergé Museum, which has the Fabergé eggs, like the one that was featured in Octopussy. So let's get back into Funeral in Berlin. Yeah. We think this is a very solid spy movie, and now a classic. If you are into spy movies like we are, and you probably are since you're listening to this, then take a look at Funeral in Berlin. Like the Ipcris file, Funeral in Berlin has many of the same people involved in its production who have ties to the James Bond movies. First, it's directed by Guy Hamilton. Yeah. So this is 1966, and he directed the Bond film Goldfinger, which released in 1964, yeah. He did Timons Are Forever, Live and Let Die, The Man with the Golden Gun. And he was also the pre-production director on The Spy Who Loved Me. So he was fresh off some very intense Bond filming for really one of the greatest Bond movies ever, Goldfinger. Yeah. I'd say one of the greatest movies ever, yeah. Goldfinger. And, you know, what about the production design? Ken Adam did both Goldfinger and Funeral in Berlin, as well as The Ipcris File, and five other Bond movies. Wow, these are two huge connections from Bond to this very solid 1966 spy film. But wait, like the Ipcris file, Harry Saltzman produced this movie too. Of course, Saltzman co-produced many of the early Bond movies along with Albert R. Broccoli, Cubby Broccoli, and had a production company to do this. He used it for film production of eight movies from 1965 through 1998, including three Harry Palmer films with Michael Caine, including The Ipcris File from 1965, Funeral in Berlin, which we're doing now in 1966, and Billion Dollar Brain in 1967. Now, Frank Ernst, who was the location manager on Funeral in Berlin, had his hand in many different roles in the James Bond movies series. So, one, you know, one more tie in there. So, will we see some Bond-like elements in Funeral in Berlin? Hmm. Let's unearth this together. And we also need to remember that 1966 was the first year since 1962 that there wasn't a James Bond movie released. Yeah, that's So, there was a void that came out for both Funeral in Berlin and the Quiller Memorandum. I mean, remember the days when there was a year between releases? Yeah, those were the good old days. Of our favorite spy movies. (laughs) Now we're five, six, seven years in between. And interestingly, Saltzman approached Dayton in 1962 to secure rights for making a movie based on the Ipcris file. The Ipcris file hadn't even been published yet. (laughs) Palmer is gritty and more of your 
everyday kind of spy doing gritty spy work, not like Bond, although Bond does some gritty spy work. And Salzman told Dayton something like, hey, I'm the only guy in the world who's not going to make your hero a Bond-like character, (laughs) (laughs) which is probably true at the time, you know? So this is when Dr. No was just coming out and Fleming knew of Len Dayton and what he was doing. And actually, he liked The Ipcris File and said it was one of his favorite books of the year in 1962. In Funeral in Berlin, what is the mission? The movie centers on Harry Palmer, a British agent, who's assigned to get to Berlin to retrieve a communist defector, Colonel Stock. Hey, wait, a communist defector? Like Koskoff in The Living Daylights, maybe? (laughs) Absolutely. (laughs) And very much like the way Koskoff, quote, defected unquote. (laughs) We'll take a look. Of course, nothing goes smoothly, and there are twists and turns that you must pay attention to. The photography paints a very bleak picture of East Berlin in 1966. East and West Berlin were divided, and it was not easy for East Berliners to leave. There was a wall and guard towers between the divided city. This is the backdrop for the entire film. Now, it's kind of interesting how they did this in comparison to the movie The Spy Who Came In From the Cold. Mm. In Funeral in Berlin, the color tones of the movie are very muted, but they are in color. In The Spy Who Came In From the Cold, which came out a year earlier, Martin Ritt, who was the director, decided to shoot that in black and white. So we have two movies that came out a year apart with very different approaches how to portray the bleakness of the divided Berlin. And if you look at this, really, they're both bleak pictures of East Berlin, without a doubt. But the color in Funeral in Berlin versus the black and white and the spy who came in from the cold, it looks like a party in the Funeral in Berlin. (laughs) (laughs) All right, we're going to move on. The opening shots show the contrast between the successful and comfortable West Berlin and the dismal communist East Berlin. A worker under guard is helping to lay landmines near the barbed wire fence to prevent people from escaping East Berlin. In a moment, he runs and jumps into a large bucket that is on the ground, lowered by a crane on the other side. Shots are fired, but he escapes to the West successfully. He's a musician, by the way. Now, skip ahead to 1969 on Her Majesty's Secret Service. Does this scene sound a little familiar? (laughs) Peter Hunt is now directing. Remember when Bond is in Bern, heading up to the lawyer Gumbold's office to crack his safe and get info on Blofeld? How is the safe cracking machine slash combo photocopier brought into the office? (laughs) Oh, yeah, that's right. (laughs) (laughs) No, no, Bond could not carry this large device. No, it was hoisted up to the balcony of Gumbold's office by a large bin, same kind, by a crane. Wow. Yeah, this time they didn't have anybody shooting at it. (laughs) Yeah, no, not this time. Bond retrieves it, uses it, and as the bin is hoisted back up, he throws it into the bin for safe retrieval on the ground by another MI6 agent. (laughs) Not a coincidence, (laughs) for sure. The whole opening sequences sets us up for the overall contrast between the East and the West, the conflict between communism and the free world, and the whole storyline here. All right, we haven't met Palmer yet in this film. Yeah, but we did meet him in the Ipcris file. Yeah, we know, now, we know now, quite we, a bit about him yeah, from but, the Ipcris file. But in the books, he didn't have a name. No, he didn't have a name in the books. So when it came time for the movies, they had to give him a name, so they gave him Harry Palmer. And we talk about that in the Ipcris File podcast. Yeah, exactly. He's got a name, Harry Palmer. Well, we're going to see Palmer when we cut to the next scene of Palmer in his home with a woman. His relationship with the woman is unclear. (laughs) But it is morning, and she's wearing a pajama top and and maybe underwear. I think think they kind of show a glimpse of of underwear or something. (laughs) Kind of like Sylvia Trench in Dr. No. Oh, yeah. Oh, another coincidence. Another coincidence. The radio is playing and someone is playing the piano, which turns out to be the escape musician that we just talked about from the opening scenes. Palmer does not like the music, and he asks, who's playing the piano with his elbows? 
and he wants coffee. I mean, what is it with all these spy movies and coffee? I just don't understand it. Yeah, what's another spy movie with coffee? I don't know. One of our sponsors is spycoffees.com. Maybe that's why. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe we can just notice it more. Yeah, hey, yeah. I mean, they're, look at this. I'm drinking some now, actually. Ah. It is good. They're a veteran-owned small business offering a variety of coffee blends in both ground and whole bean and even K-cups. So get some double-agent medium roast, which I'm drinking now, one of our favorites here at spymovienavigator.com. Our listeners, shh, get a 20% discount on purchases when they use the spy code SPYNAV, S-P-Y-N-A-V, as the coupon code at checkout. So, if you're a coffee lover, head over to spycoffees.com and order some very good coffee. And just remember to use SpyNav for your 20% discount. All right. So, while Palmer's getting his coffee, his phone rings, yeah. and he answers it. And the man on the other end says, this is Round Robin calling Chavich. <laughs> I love this part. <laughs> it's like, hmm, who's Round Robin? Obviously, he's using a code which Palmer immediately breaks ranks and <laughs> asks Chico what he wants, calling him Chico, <laughs> not Chavich. <laughs> Chico wants Palmer to observe security procedure, and Palmer doesn't tend to follow the rules. And that Bald Eagle wants to see him urgently at Bald Eagle's home. <laughs> so I love that. Chico keeps doing it. <laughs> yeah, Palmer breaks it. Chico keeps going. So while Chico's talking, Palmer's staring at the woman's beautiful, sexy legs. Yeah. Very Bond-like, he says, tell him I'll be late. <laughs> yeah, exactly. He was late in the Ipcris file. We think it's an ongoing trend here as a character trait. <laughs> so Bond often played off his opportunity with a woman to delay leaving for an important trip or meeting. Remember in Dr. No when he finds her in his apartment and he says he has to leave immediately? She's very playful with him, and he says, well, maybe not immediately. <laughs> yeah. Or in From Russia with Love, when he's with Sylvia Trench again, picnicking, he gets that call to come in. He says it'll be an hour, but Sylvia <laughs> Trench is again playful with him, and he says, make that two. Make that two. I love it. So we know Palmer's a bit of a rebel as he broke ranks with the security and protocol on the phone. <laughs> and we saw some of this in the Ipcris file as well. And now he shows a keen interest in women at the expense of his boss having to wait. Bond would smile at that. So he takes a bus to Bald Eagle's house, <laughs> sees his boss's wife, Mrs. Ross. So and that, she, would make, that would make Bald Eagle Mr. Ross. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which we and have she, to remember from the Ipcris file, his boss was Ross. Yeah. And she tells him he's around back. She goes with him. And Palmer says, morning, sir. And his boss quips back, good afternoon, Palmer. <laughs> yeah. It's being late. Uh, this trait is becoming more and more prevalent, as we see from the Ipcris file and now in Funeral in Berlin as well. Then Mrs. Ross says to her husband, this is Palmer's boss, or it's the M equivalent, that she's taking the Bentley to the butcher. And Mr. Ross says, don't get blood all over the car. And she asked Palmer, how could you work for that dreadful man? And Palmer says, loyalty. Ah, another Bond-like feature. Yeah. If Bond was loyal to the cause and country, Ross notes that he is late. Presumably, he enjoyed some time with that woman in his flat. <laughs> yeah. So Ross hands Palmer a packet. Palmer opens it, and he knows a lot about the contents already. Colonel Stock, KGB in charge of the intelligence sector. Ross says he is thinking of defecting and says to Palmer, your plane leaves at 3.30 this well, that afternoon. Was, but that was after Palmer said to him, I'll go tomorrow or something. Ross replies, hey, you're leaving at 3.30 this afternoon. Get yeah. on it. Yeah, it's kind of like I'm telling Bond and Dr. No at 3.30 in the morning that Bond is on a 7 a.m. flight to Jamaica. That's the same kind of thing. You're going now. <laughs> so we see the similar relationship between Palmer and Ross, as we see between Bond and M. Now, one thing that distinguishes this movie from when James Bond goes to help Koskoff defect in The Living Daylights, mm. he's been briefed on the mission, but not by M. So he actually was briefed by Saunders from Station V in, B in Vienna. Yeah, that's so, true. So 
Saunders tries to direct Bond, and Bond doesn't really take any directive from him at all in this scene. Yeah. You see more of the character here of Palmer as it develops. As Palmer is leaving here, he quips to Ross, have you ever thought of it, sir? (laughs) (laughs) Ross is quizzical looking at him like, what? And Palmer says, defecting. I have. (laughs) (laughs) So this is beyond what Bond would say to M because of the loyalty factor. Yeah, although but Bond's we, quit on him a bunch of times and oh, retired, that's, though. Yeah. That's true. Yeah. But he, he wouldn't defect. But we, no. but we still know that Palmer really doesn't mean it because no. of his loyalty. Loyalty. There are quite a few quips like this all throughout the movie that Palmer makes. I think he might even have more quips than Roger Moore's Bond did in a movie, although I actually didn't take the time to count them. For, believe it or not, I didn't do that research, Dan. Yeah. Oh, my God. No, you're <laughs> kidding me. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, he does. I think he has a lot of quips. He but does. He, he delivers them <laughs> in a typical British way. Deadpan. <laughs> Deadpan, boom, yeah. in your face kind of thing. But the Dry humor of his. Dry humor, he, yeah. My favorite line in this whole, in really the movie. I like weeds. Yes, they're easy to grow. Ross is working in his garden in the in the yard there as as Palmer talks to him, and it's, it doesn't look pretty. And he yeah. talks about, hey, you don't want flowers and stuff like they, yeah. like they have in cemeteries or something, he said. <laughs> I just love the, the dryness of the, yes, they're easy to grow. Yeah. <laughs> and we remember this scene later in the movie. So it was just a fun little quip that's going to come back later in the movie. Yeah, yeah. So Palmer's got to head to West Berlin. So he's got to get his passport and papers. So he heads over to Hallam's place and Ross sends him there to get his fake passport. And he looks at it and Harry's name on the passport is Edmund, Mr. Edmund Dorf. Palmer jokes, he'd rather be Rock Hunter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man. As he exit, Hallam says to him, give my love to Berlin. I was there with Monty in 45. Of course, Montgomery. Palmer mumbles, so that's why the Germans surrendered. <laughs> <laughs> Again, Bond-like quips here. And you don't really see a lot of spies in other movies making quips like this. You, you certainly don't see it in the, the spy who came in from the cold and virtually any other spy movie that yep. they're making quips like this. Maybe but, Mission Impossible. Yeah, but, but like that quip that he talked about the weeds instead of roses, mm-hmm. we're going to hear that come back up later in the movie rock hunter then you know wanting to be called rock hunter comes back up in this movie again uh-huh. so it's not just that the quips happen the quips have life yeah that's good that's a good point yeah so harry lands in west berlin and notice he comes in on pan am just like in the bond movies dr yeah. no on her Majesty's secret service and Actually, it's weird and you know tom i was i've been watching because i like roger Moore. i've been watching the saint and I, I started from the, the very first episode, and he, he flies in all over the world in that series. And this is 1962 that the series started. And guess what airline he flies on? Yeah, Pan, Pan Am. Am. Yeah. Well, most movies seem to either, especially from that era, seem to either be Pan Am or TWA. That's true. And both are out of business now. But And both are out of business now. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Weird. So he, he lands, he gets there. And Johnny Vulcan is there to pick him up. But there's a guy there watching his every move. In a car. He's he's sitting in a car. Mm -hmm. And he really reminds me of the Bulgarian in From Russia with Love. Yeah. If we remember that guy, he had the bushy mustache, kind of dark features, dark hair. And in this movie, the guy who's watching has the dark hair, the dark features, and the bushy mustache. So it really took me back to From Russia with Love. In in Istanbul, yeah. And in Istanbul. Yeah. Yeah. In the car, Vulcan asks Palmer, by the way, Harry, I never had the chance to thank you for covering for me on that N-A-A-F-I deal, the NAFI deal. And I'm thinking, what the hell is that? Yeah, really. And that's why maybe Palmer is working for Ross now because of him covering. And he asked him, how did you beat the rap? And Palmer says, I didn't. It was either jail or work for Ross. So now we know why, in a way, 
he's working for Ross that we did not know in the Ipcris file. So we have a little hint here. But we just yeah, still they, don't well, know. Well, they hinted in Ipcris that he wasn't there something. voluntarily. He was there right. a little reluctantly. Yeah, but don't, we, we have no idea why. Now we think, okay, so it has something to do with this NAFI deal. And he said, no, I didn't. It was either go to jail or work for Ross. But that sounds a lot like Naya in Mission Impossible 2. Yeah, because she has to kind of go along. And Vulcan here says, well, he was right. Your idea was brilliant. And Palmer says, so brilliant, <laughs> I'm still on suspended sentence. <laughs> <laughs> now, I researched NAFI, and as far as I can tell, it just stood for Navy, Army, and Air Force Institute. That was a company created by the British government on December 9th, 1920, to run recreational establishments needed by the British Armed Forces and to sell goods to servicemen and their families. It runs clubs, bars, shops, supermarkets, laundrettes, restaurants, cafes, and other facilities on most British military bases and also canteens on board Royal Navy ships. So what did Harry do covering for Vulcan there? We still don't know, and I can't figure it out. Yeah, they don't, they don't really give it away yet. No. At least in, the, in this movie. Uh, we'll see if maybe it's in the billion dollar brain if we ever get to that one. But yeah, yeah that's, uh, we'll see. But anyways, Palmer is posing as a lingerie salesman. Yeah, that's good. And there's a, there's a fun little scene going through security with, about that. <laughs> yeah. But Vulcan takes him back to their garment manufacturing plant and their office, which is really just a cover for the British agents running as a regular business. In West Berlin, right. In, yeah. yeah, in West Berlin. It's a real entity, but it's really a cover place for the British agents. So that person who was trailing them, the one with the mustache, sees him go in. Yeah. And we find out later that this guy ends up being Aaron Levine, who's a key player in the way the movie flushes out. Yeah, yeah. Palmer does not believe that Colonel Stock wants to defect, but he's going right. to head to East Berlin to meet with the colonel at this rendezvous point at this really dilapidated building with an address of 59. Yeah. This is directly opposite of what Bond thought about Koskov in The Living Daylights. That's true. Bond thought Koskov really wanted to defect. So there is a nice twist between these two movies with regard to the defecting higher-ups and the enemies of Britain. As Vulcan drops Palmer off at the Allied checkpoint, which we call Checkpoint Charlie, he asks Palmer, so do you have the address? And Palmer says, and my Luger pistol, and my cyanide pills, and my inflatable Batman <laughs> suit. You gotta love this guy's attitude. His, I, his sense of humor is fabulous. Yeah, and he delivers these lines, which like, it's in your face, but... <laughs> Smooth, low-key. Low-key. But he gets through checkpoint Charlie at the border, and Harry's allowed to pass. So now, that's, that's good. That's good. But now we saw a representation of Checkpoint Charlie in The Spy Who Came In From The Cold. Yeah. We'll see it again in the Bond movie Octopussy. The mm -hmm. Bridge of Spies is based on moving somebody across that area and The Man From Uncle. So this is a fairly popular place in spy movies. Yeah, that's true. Levine, the guy we saw in the car originally, is still tailing him and sees him go through the checkpoint and go across the border. Palmer takes a taxi to this rendezvous point. Though he wants the taxi to wait, the taxi takes off. And he's in this bleak, kind of bombed out looking place. Yeah. I, that would be pretty frightening, I would think. Yeah, and now you're alone there in yeah. East Berlin. It's like, oh, okay. No one else is around until a car pulls up with armed soldiers who take Palmer and bring him to a building and throw him into a dark room. Then the lights come on, and Colonel Stock is there. He had Palmer arrested to avoid suspicion, he says. But he must be careful, as he says, he is being watched. Now, this is the guy, of course, who wants to defect. So now Palmer is face-to-face -face with Colonel Stock. And what does Stock say to him? I wish to defect. He, t he tells some lies, but Palmer, just like Bond, knows the truth. Palmer, I know everything about you. <laughs> now, this is another... Another good line. You could have put this in Mission Impossible, too. Palmer says, I know everything about you from the size of your refrigerator to the cubic capacity of your mistress. <laughs> oh, okay, what? What does this mean? More sexual innuendos here. For sure, I mean, refrigerators have cubic capacity. That's how they're measured. You can drop it at that point. <laughs> okay. So, yeah. So we got him here. Hit Bond, Mission Impossible. And now we got Harry Palmer doing the same kind of thing. More euphemisms. Ah, uh, what can a refrigerator mean? Ah, anyway, let's get back to it. Stock says, you are not as stupid as you look. <laughs> I like that. 
And more banter. Stock says it'll be good headlines for the English when he defects. <laughs> I love this too. Palmer says we get plenty of Russians. Too bad you're not Chinese. <laughs> I mean, it's just great stuff. Doc says he'll cooperate with providing information, but says, hey, I'm not a trader like a regular trader. He says, I'm still a good communist. Yeah, no, I love this scene. It's a fun scene. I do too. Stock is played with a lot of humor. I mean, he's supposed to be this big communist bad guy. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He wants it affect, and they've got all his humor there. And you just totally love this guy. I mean, you want to like him. Yeah. And I think this scene may have inspired the scene in the movie, the Quentin Tarantino movie, Inglorious Bastards, when Londo wants to surrender to the U.S. Stock says, I want colonels pay for life. Don't we all? A house in the country. Oh, how many bedrooms? Oh, bedrooms do not matter, but they must have a big garden. I'm a peasant at heart, and I want to grow roses in my old age. Here we are talking about growing roses again. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So Harry comes in with his quip, and he says, in England, roses are out, weeds are in. <laughs> I just love how they tie this stuff back together. Yeah. And again, in Inglorious Bastards, <laughs> La Landa says almost exactly the same type of needs in order to defect. Military pension and benefits under my proper rank. Full citizenship for myself. Well, that goes without saying. And... I would like the United States of America to purchase property for me on Nantucket Island. All right, now as a side note, as we saw in the Ipcris file, Palmer really does not look like Bond. He's a working class spy making maybe 30 pounds a week. I think they mentioned that somewhere. I think Stock said, hey, you were called to do all this for 30 pounds a week. He wears decent clothing, nothing spectacular. Has dark framed glasses, unspy like but I think they were French glasses. It said that somewhere. He's good looking. He's Michael Caine. And he wears a Colombo style raincoat that's got like a hundred pockets in it. <laughs> but he's cool. Always. He's always cool. He doesn't yeah, sweat it. <laughs> yeah, he, he doesn't sweat it because we have to remember he was forced into spying to get the suspended sentence. Yeah. So he agreed to be a spy. So he's really a crook, so it, it makes sense that he wouldn't likely have the panache of Bond. Yeah. Stock is a, is a funny guy, and he's a great character. It's conditions for escape. I must have a foolproof method of escape, organized by professionals, like by Otto Kreutzmann. Now, Palmer must find this Kreutzmann, who apparently has gotten a lot of people out of East Berlin to the West. Before Palmer leaves, Stock says... You must admit, I scared you English. With I the love car. the fact that he just calls him English, too. Yeah, with, with, you know, taking him into the car, bringing him into the dark room and all this stuff. So that was a, that was a good little line to kind of wrap up that whole little scene, which was cool. <laughs> all right, so we have Harry Palmer back in action. We have a Russian, Stock, who wants to defect and seems very much in control. This is a good spot to break off part one of Funeral in Berlin. We'll pick up part two with Harry Palmer meeting Vulcan again about Kreutzmann. Great stuff coming up. This has been Tom Pizzotto. And Dan Silvestri. From SpyMovieNavigator.com, where we've been cracking the code of Funeral in Berlin. Thanks for listening. Join us for part two in our next podcast. Please give us a five-star rating on your favorite podcast app. That really does help us a lot. Like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter, and on Instagram, too. Thanks again.